Miso? No, no. <laughs> Close. I practiced that for ages. Totally <laughs> I'm sorry. Screwed it up. Uh, this afternoon, so uh, ESL user experience. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about the European Space Agency and how they use open source in one particular context. So let me briefly introduce the team. That's Thomas, who is sitting here in a third row. He is uh, famous for the Map Cache project and uh, Map Server Committer. And then it's uh, Fabian and myself from the UX in Austria. Uh, we're also Map Server Committer, and we're part of the project I'm talking about. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, okay, a brief introduction to the whole NGEO, as it's called, as it is called project. That's the next generation user services from ESA. I will briefly introduce the component that we are delivering, that's the browse server. Talk about some map cache enhancements that Thomas did, mostly, <laughs> or exclusively, maybe. And after all this boring stuff, I will come to the fun part and try to give a live demonstration. Let's see how this, this is going to work out. Um, yes. OK, European Space Agency. They are uh, trying to make a new a rehearsal of their existing user services. So they have big archives of satellite data, and they're still growing. And they want to provide access to those archives, or the need to provide access to these archives. So what they want to have with this new version is fully online data access to the services. Um, what data is it? In future, you may have heard of, of the GMES program, of the big European initiative. It's the Global Monitoring for Environment and Security. It got renamed a couple of months ago to Copernicus, but nobody's using that name. So that will be in there. Um, that a lot of the Sentinel satellites, uh, Sentinel-1, 2, 3, and big data. And I think Sentinel-2 is comparable to the latest Landsat mission, sort of. And of course, they have all their legacy mission. They already have like the whole Envisat archive and others, and third-party missions where they buy data in, and so on and so forth. Um, another big objective of this project is that they want to have a fully centralized configuration management thingy. So we need to, needed to, to add this to the, to the software. I, OK, I'll come to that in a second. It's easy on the, on the architecture diagram. No. <laughs> um, another big objective is that it should be a generic system usable for other PDGSs, payload data ground segments, as ESA calls them. So ESA wants to have the software to provide to other satellite mission operators if they want to reuse it. OK, that's for the ESA project. Our part in this whole story is the so-called browse server. So the users come to the archive, they search for data, and they want to view what they have. So that's what the browse images are for. And what we're using, uh, we're providing the standardized access to those browse images. So big number of images. You have the, that's the old two-dimensional, uh, but you have the time dimension, of course. So what we need is to access single images in time, but also to have multiple images, like a whole month. And so typical queries on, on, on satellite archives. So in the middle, you can see what we call the browse server. We are reusing a software stack that's well known, I think. It's a map server in the middle and Cheeto uh, for the uh, raster processing, input, output, everything. Uh, and we have on top of that for the uh, metadata management, uh, the, what we call UX server. So it's uh, written in Python. And it's uh, accessing map server internals via map script. And we store the metadata in, in, in UX server, so we don't have a, a map file. We have all this in the in the Python uh, library, <coughs> and this stack provides the, an internal WMS interface that is used then by Map Cache to feed the cache. In the end, uh, Map Cache serves uh, WMTS and WMS, so Web Map Tile Service and Web Map Service for the viewing in, in the in the web client. Uh, bit of complications is that we need to also take authorization into account. So that's a feature that we will have to implement. It's not yet done. But we'll yeah, we use Shibole if somebody knows that for the authentication. And then we have the authorization, which goes to another component of the NGO system. 
and we have to cache the decision so that we can be really performant. Also, we have authorization. Uh, another objective, as I said, is this central configuration. So it's the NGL controller component that uh, sends us new layer configurations, for example. So we have a new data set. We have a new satellite mission that we want to add. Here is the configuration XML configure. Or we want to have an additional uh, projection for this data set. Please add this. And of course, the, how comes the data in? We have there's an uh, NGU feed component where, where we have defined another XML interface. ESA loves XML these days. Um, that the how to how that describes the data that are to be ingested. So we first via web dev we get the browse images themselves. I come to that also in a second, and then we get the uh, we, it gets triggered via an XML uh, sent to us, which includes all the metadata information we need. Okay, let's see. Did I forget anything? Ah, entirely based on open source. That's important. And OGC, yeah, configuration, feed, Shibole. Okay, that's just for the online version, I would say. Um, I said pre-processing. So we get images. We get various different kinds of images, mainly JPEGs. Basically, there are three ways how we get the georeferencing information. So I start with the last one, which because it's the easiest, it's already georeferenced. Yo, we, we win. The, the other part is we get a regular grid of type points. Okay, that's encoded in XML. Imagine how it looks a bit ugly, but okay, it works. And then the, the most common way we get the images are with is with a footprint. So we have an XML structure that says the first pixel is this position on Earth and then it goes round and we have to pre-process that image. So what are we doing in the pre-processing step is several optimizations. First of all, we need to know the footprint in geographic coordinates as a polygon. Then we reproject the, the image already in the projection that we need to serve in the end to be in order to be performant. We add, of course, an alpha channel because usually the reprojection means we have these uh, black triangles. I guess everybody has seen those. And we add internal uh, optimizations like tiling and overviews and store geotiffs in the end. We also add compression because the, the limiting factor here is the storage space. Because we seed everything in the cache, we don't have the big problem on the caching that we need to be performing on the WMS interface. <coughs> OK, now coming to what, what was added to, to map cache. First of all, as I already said, that's the time dimension support. So as I said, we have archives of lots of uh, satellite images, and we want to be able to access each single image, but also intervals, time intervals of images that are merged then together. So what we have here in the map cache configuration, I assume you're all familiar to some extent with map cache. <laughs> you can add a time dimension, and you say you have a SQLite file, and in this SQLite file, I store all the time start and end dates for which I have an image. And then you provide the query, how to access this. So in this case, group, that's just the formatting for the time. So you select from the time. Then you get some parameters, like which tile set we are in, and the, <coughs> the current time. So it's here, that's what we get from, from map cache as parameter for the query. In addition, we have the the bounding box of the current tile that is requested, so that we use that as well. And then for performance reasons or for that it ends eventually, we have also a limit that we, in this case, we only want to merge 100 tiles. So in the end, what this query does, we get a, a, a WMTS request that says, give me everything for this particular day. Then we have start time at midnight and uh, end time at midnight again for this day. And we get for the tile the, the bounding box. We, from this query, we get back all the time entries that we have. But OK, of course, the, only the last 100 ones. And then map cache goes into the tile cache and merges all these tiles and serves it as one back to the client. I see questions, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Any questions directly to this? No? OK. Um, 
Okay. You make sure that your time values in that SQLite data set directly match what you've ingested into the cache. Yes. It's not a direct relationship. Yes, so as exactly. You, as you put new stuff into the cache, it's not automatically going into that SQLite no, data set. No, that SQLite file has to be maintained uh, exactly. externally. Yeah, okay. exactly. But I would put it the other way around. You have first the SQLite file, and then you, ser then you see everything in the cache. Because in the cache, you can then, of course, use other functionality. And this is, for example, very important for us, the read-only functionality. Because you can imagine we have only each satellite take is only a small portion on the Earth, and we don't want to see the whole world. But still, the layer itself needs to serve the whole world. So that's why we use a bounding box in the seeding request. And with the read-only uh, setting, we make sure that for all tasks that are not in the cache, it's assumed that they are empty, and empty images are returned. So we have a fully <coughs> pre-seeded cache. Given the, the possibility that we include in the query the bounding box, we could also n don't necessarily need to make it uh, completely pre-seeded, because it would always, for the seeding step, go first to the query. But in the beginning, we didn't have this. Um, by the way, that's, uh, all this functionality is available in the version that was released four days ago, four, five days ago. Um, another interesting <coughs> feature is this configure max cache zoom. So for uh, browser images, for example, you, you, they have a certain resolution. And you, it, you, it makes no sense to go beyond that resolution in, in seeding the cache or caching this, this data. So what we do is like uh, zoom level 10, what is it here, 8 is configured as the highest zoom level that is actually cached. And afterwards, so like zoom level 9, 10, and so on, it's uh, computed from zoom le level 8. So you don't uh, need, you, there's no new information anyway. Oops. Um, another interesting optimization is because we are using SQLite caches. And uh, in SQLite caches, uh, Thomas did a very Nice trick. For single, Im for single color images, he's actually storing just one, no, it's nine bytes, but just the one value of that color. And then on the fly, it's automatically uh, expanded to a one color PNG image. That's very nice when you want to save on disk space. Okay, let's go to the fun part. Please turn off your con internet connections. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. OK. So by the way, that's uh, also our uh, submission to the opening up the map challenge. It's called Changing Times, <laughs> if you want to vote. Um, go away. So what you can see here, so I selected a time already pre-selected where Nottingham, where an image over Nottingham is visible. So of course, you can change <coughs> the the time, the, the time interval that you're showing, we're showing then this warning that only the latest 100 uh, time values that are available are shown. But as you can see, that's all live. That's really done on the server. It's merging all the tiles into one and sending to up to 100. Okay. So you can scroll through the story. Um, telling some, some, some story here. You can read through it later if you want. OK, now, yeah, change the time. As you see, we, we lost some images, because they're simply not in the time interval we, we are still seeing. OK, that's, by the way, that's uh, Vienna, where we are from, <laughs> just if you're interested. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to show you that it's really working that so that the uh, map cache is really well performing. It's uh, coming live from servers in Austria or maybe Germany, I don't know. OK. Um, another thing, interesting thing is what, we, what, what are you seeing here? Uh, maybe I should <coughs> give you those numbers. That's a, a data set from, from ESA. It's uh, around 18,000 images. Um, the cache is around 10 gigabytes, the SQLite cache. So this is an, an overview of the whole data <coughs> set. So it's uh, seeded as, as one layer covering all 18,000 images. So this is not now 
uh, done on the, the merging is not done on the fly that's preceded. <laughs> but if we switch back to the that's done now fly. <coughs> Oops. <coughs> okay. So you see. Even on this on this low connection, nice. <laughs> um, I think I should give uh, credits to to Mapbox from whom we borrowed this idea with the story. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yay! Okay, I can skip the the backup screenshots. I think it worked. <laughs> <laughs> conclusions. Every presentation has to have conclusions. Okay, good in the time. So we see that there is mature open source software building blocks that can be readily re reused for operational software. That's our main conclusion. That's uh, the <laughs> in, the, in the project, the quality review, as it called it, for the first version of all the components is just to be over. So our component is finished, others are a bit late, but that should then start really the going into operations anytime soon. That's another very interesting conclusion. As we all know, open source software, it uh, allows for easy adoptions. Adop adop when if you need, like I said, these four uh, enhancements we needed for Mapcache, it was basically one talk to Thomas, and <laughs> we did it. That's very cool. Yeah, and of course, that's, that's the important part, that all this new functionality sponsored by ESA in the end is now available to everybody. So you can immediately use it. It's already released. And uh, as we had already in the keynote, for example, about the map story, time access is important. <laughs> I have to acknowledge the ESA. They sponsored this. <laughs> they give us the money. OK, done that. So thank you, everybody. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say anything because it's such a comprehensive presentation. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about uh, scalability and how, like, is the intention that this will be handled in millions of scenes? And it's that's really the idea, yes. Network <laughs> file system or how is that? Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely the requirement that, I mean, the Sentinel missions, they will acquire millions of scenes and they want to handle it with that system. So. Can you talk at all about how that's going to be accomplished? Or <laughs> we will see. So at the moment, what we what we done uh, is this eighteen thousand images cache, and we didn't have any big big problem. I must say as well that we that the seeding step is uh, that's the the slowest part of it. <laughs> um, then there is also the issue that we sometimes we have to have uh, distinct time intervals in the cache so that they are not allowed to overlap. So if we get overlapping time intervals, we merge them to one. And of course, then we have to unseed what we had already, at, at least at, in the overlapping parts in the cache. And this is particularly slow <laughs> <laughs> because we're using a SQLite cache. So the unseeding is the, the really slow part. But we, so we think in the next evolution of the system, we will make the seeding completely asynchronous. At the moment, we do it right after each ingest we seed. We ma will make it asynchronous. So then we can wait for several images and do only one seeding step if we need to merge. Some of them. So do, you, do you necessarily know when the last image comes in and you need to start seeding? Is, I mean, do you seed as each image comes in, or do you seed once all the images are No. Started? As I said, we seed after. So that the, the process is that for each image that we receive, that the ingestion is triggered, we run through the whole pre-processing <laughs> and the seeding. And we, as I said, in the next evolution, we want to switch this that we just run through the pre-processing that we have the internal WMS interface and then we see it only I don't know <laughs> once an hour or whatever and you then can how, how big do you expect each um, <coughs> each cache to be huh that's a good question actually <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, 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 I mean there is this there's this limit with the uh, around right. one terabyte at the moment yeah. I think we, well, we will go in we're going to eat it Okay. And it was kind of a seamless change between SQLite and Berkeley 
Ah, that's good to know. <laughs> and, uh, and but I guess for now for the time axis we that won't work at the moment. Well, it's a SQLite interface. Is it? Ah, okay. We need to talk. <laughs> Yes. Um, is it possible to um, identify the source of each uh, in, uh, integer to the tool in question? What do you mean by source? And for example, is it possible to know whether the image is coming from Rapida or, or UI or... Ah, okay. Or so what what I what I've been showing you in the live demonstration is just a simple open layers uh, interface. That's not not the interface that is of the of the NGO project of the user user services, because we are doing just the browse server. So the the actual interface of the ESA user services will be a different kind, also based on on open layers of course. But uh, there you will have to log in for certain data sets, and there you will definitely see which data sets so which uh, satellite missions you're searching. And so the results are on exactly for those missions that you're searching. And there is even a possibility that you, that you so you, you're searching also at against the catalog, and you can highlight the single scenes, and they get highlighted also in the map. And that's why we, need, why we had this uh, important requirement that we need to be able to access single images on the WMTS interface. No, they, those images are all in in, in Mapcache. You in, in in fact, you have eighteen thousand separate pyramids, <laughs> but just with the lo lots of blanks because we're just hitting the the bounding box of the of the images. But then already clear though what image you're exactly aiming at. You're just um, at an so f for each scene, you have to complete pyramid from zoom level zero to whatever zoom level you have configured, like eight was in the example. But only in the, in the area where you have actually actually have data. Referring yeah. to each mission. Yeah. It will be everything that you do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. In the operations. Okay. Yeah. We are not. We are in. Uh, we are implementing the generic system. We are. We are not the responsible for the operations in the end. So we hand this over. Yeah. Ah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Sure. Um, uh, in the end, uh, to put it short, it adds the EOWCS, or the Earth Observation extension of WCS to Map Server. What does that mean? Um, it adds uh, like the storage of metadata, so you have additional metadata in, in the EO coverages, as we call them, and particularly you have the time, start and end, and the footprint. And what we all add as well is we have an, an additional operation on on uh, in WCS, describe your coverage set where you can make a spatial temporal search on those coverages. So that's why we need the time and footprint. And then we have uh, two data types: how to group coverages. One is data set series. That's what we use here. That's for uh, inhomogeneous grouping. But you still you have one layer or one coverage you can query. One data set series you can query to to retrieve all these sub uh, sub coverages. And in WMS, you have one layer, and all the sub images are layers by their own. But you can still retrieve via the time axis the, the single images. And the other one is uh, for mosaics. And if if you maybe if you want to have a more uh, elaborate uh, answer, then we have a talk tomorrow at I think it's 11:30 somewhere. I don't know where. And by the way, I I, I was supposed to mention this that in the background of this uh, <laughs> of this map that I was showing there, you see the nice terrain layer. That's the submission of Jochen to the opening of the maps challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I simply reused it. <laughs> okay. You talk about the satellite scenes. So who splits up the satellite data into scenes in the first place? Because a lot of scientific users actually like to have the continuous one. Yes. That's that's yeah, I mean I, I know for example that for Sentinel two they are defining so a hundred three hundred kilometers grid, and they split it up. But they already uh, talked to us that they want to have a feature in the software that we are then again merge it <laughs> <laughs> in the browsers. <laughs> anyway, that's that's ease of policies. Uh, what so we have 
uh, well-defined or most of the time well-defined interfaces that we are simply implementing. Of course, we are discussing and asking, well, why I want to do that it, that way? That would <laughs> let's make us a little different. <coughs> Can't to discuss, but yeah, big big agencies they have interfaces defined and they want to use them. <laughs> Thank you. Yep.